another thoughtful business conversation. And Joe Enim, an entrepreneur, a professional teacher, and marketer, takes his turn on African Port Business Forum to discuss accessibility to quality education. He says the 21st century, driven heavily by technology, means quality and practical education must not be dependent on brick and mortar, especially in Africa. And so, through the Wolo e-learning project in Ghana, Joe Enim has unleashed the power of technology to create an authentic learning experience for both teacher and student, available on tablet, desktop, and mobile. Here is the thoughtful conversation with Joe Enim, the founder of the Wolo e-learning project. The whole world is changing. Life is very progressive and we have to move with the time. Um, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, had, they had a, a different way of teaching. The, the, the educational system was different. It, it's, a, it's, a new, it's a new day. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a future. So what is changing is the method and the approach. What some of us saw and what motivated me in particular to want to venture into this space um, is the fact that over the last 12, 13 years, the single issue that has been on the front burner is education. And any time the issue came up, the, um, the debate came up, especially during um, our political season, any time the issue came up, you hear two words, quality and then accessibility. So we, are, we keep talking about access, access. And access seems to be the biggest issue. Now, when we talk about access, what is access? Basically, the politicians are telling us that we need buildings for classrooms, we need buildings um, as dormitories, we need buildings um, for, for laboratories and the, and, the, and the rest of them. And we also need resources like chairs, tables, and stuff like that. So it's basically brick and mortar limitation. We are looking at having classroom blocks or buildings, fiscal buildings. And some of us are looking at the current situation around the world and what technology can fix. And we are saying, no, we cannot limit ourselves and define access to mean brick and mortar building. So we were motivated and then that's how come some of us stepped into this space because I, by the way, I'm a professional teacher. I trained as a marketer and I lived my life in the media space. So I put all the, the, the three together and I look at the opportunity we can actually harvest from employing technology to solve some of these problems. So when we talk about access, I can sit here today with uh, some pieces of devices in our hands, especially mobile phones, um, tablets, laptops, especially mobile phones. And I can have my class. A teacher can teach me. I can have my lecture. I can take assignments or quizzes. I can write examination. I can have group discussions. So we can put all these, thing, these uh, things together. And this is a very experience we go to school, you know, to go through. We, we have the learning experience in school where we go to lectures. Um, we listen to the teacher. We take notes and all that. And uh, Philip, we can actually use mobile technology to, to, to experience all this and learn. So I don't see the reason why we should limit ourselves and then in 2020 still talk about access. Access, it's a very huge problem. No, some of us don't see it as a problem. So we've been doing this, we've been developing this e-learning system and then fortunately we are here. Um, it's a new day, people are embracing it and we know we are going to make a difference. And Joe, in spite of that, I think just listening to what you're saying, it tells me that you've really given it quite a thought and a lot of planning would have gone into it, obviously, uh, with the fact of having the kind of background you have. How long did it take you to come around the picture you are painting right now? All right. Um, the first time I, I almost stepped into the space was in 2011. Um, I was exit. I had exited the media space. I was uh, investing in real estate, and I thought there was one thing I I needed to achieve, and I thought I would do something to help the educational sector. 
Um, I told a few friends about it, but I knew the time wasn't right. Two reasons. The internet infrastructure in Ghana then wasn't the best. Um, streaming video was almost impossible. Um, you have a video of whatever size, even if it's 30 minutes. I going to sit and wait for hours to be able to stream the video. So if infrastructure was weak. The second uh, point is uh, the payment system then. Uh, um, today is a lot better, but then even a credit card and having a credit card was a privilege. Currently, we have mobile payment system. Uh, then it was very difficult. Almost everything was cash, fiscal cash. So some of these points, um, we, we looked at it and I said, no, the, time, the timing wasn't right. So I left. I actually abandoned the media uh, business and retired and left. Around 2014, the issue came back again. I thought I, I could put together a group of people, some of the young people are trained in the media space, to take up the challenge. But then speaking to them and then weighing the, the magnitude of the, of the problem and what they need to put together, I realized this, this would take some kind of leadership and a lot of resources to be able to develop this because number one, you are looking at developing content that would stand the test of time. You are looking at developing content that would respond to the educational challenges. You are lo looking at developing something that would be equal, if not better than what the children are, are experiencing in their normal eight to four classroom setting. So putting all this this together, I thought that I would have to find time, you know, come back into the, the media space, use my media experience. I also employ the, the little I, I learned when I was in college and then put everything together, be able to monetize it and make it a business. Because in the first place, if you don't run it as a business, then you are not going to be able to sustain it. Because from day one, I took the decision that once it's a new technology, you don't expect somebody to come and, and, and assist right away. You know how our system operates here in Africa, especially in Ghana. Government is very slow to change, and I expected that it would take a bit um, of time before they come around and embrace. It. So then I had to now start looking at who to put on the team. Putting the team together was was quite difficult because you are looking at the key people, key players in the in the in this uh, kind of enterprise are the teachers, and then you are looking at the the media people. Um, and then again, you are looking at the uh, the entire team that would be able to put this together as a business. But the key group, teachers, they are trained in a particular way to teach. Now, if you take a teacher and you put them in front of a camera or in a different environment, naturally you are you are changing what they train to do. Because um, if you look at what we have, we are all offering now, right now. The average teacher will go to the classroom, they write on the chalkboard or what they call a marker board. They will explain sometimes they go, they, they take the notes and all that. Now we are looking at a situation where we can now flip this round and then make it a different learning experience for the teacher, both the teacher and the student. And then make it very, very interesting and fun. So we needed to also sit down and then design something that will stand the test of time. So yes, a bit of thinking went into it, and we did a lot of planning before we started doing some kind of coding for the platform, and then some kind of production, and that started late 2018. So essentially, you were almost 10 years ahead of your time, uh, where you had the idea and kind of had to wait, forced to wait for technology to catch up, um, for the payment systems to catch up as well. Uh, how did it feel like seeing a workable idea in your mind and yet not being able to implement it at once because of all these uh, si situational limitations? I've experienced this over and over. Um, at least I can count a couple of times, four times maybe. Um, I've experienced this a couple of times. Let me cite two examples. Um, around, two, uh, around 1998, I introduced new syndication in Ghana. Every news uh, in Ghana, you would, you would think that every news should be in Accra, which is the capital. So almost everything happened here, seat of government, all the uh, you know 
different organs of government is in Accra. So everybody thought that news should be in Accra. And how do you get news to the rural areas so that the people over there are, are also, you know, uh, enlightened? So I set up a system where now we can actually take news from here, whether live or pre-recorded, and take them to the other parts of the country. Um, and that time, technology wasn't also available. Um, the challenge then was to actually build some kind of system that would deliver the news. And I had to put together a couple of radio stations around the country. Um, it took a bit of work. It was very difficult, very challenging, very expensive. But I did it. Somewhere along the line, technology uh, caught up. And then today, almost every radio station uh, would start their news in Accra. They have syndicated network all over. I would cite a second example. Um, about 13, 14 years ago, again, I did what you call Simuka. So I pioneered it in Ghana, where I was setting up um, a radio. Uh, in fact, it was a multimedia platform for a client. Um, I was commissioned to develop a TV station and then I proposed that we should add a radio station, newspapers and an online platform to the original idea um, of a TV station. Now, the idea was that if I'm going to build a, a radio station and a TV station, I should be able to integrate them. Um, simulcast wasn't popular around the world, but I thought that if I put my camera in the radio station, in the radio studio. I should be able to put it on TV. If I put my camera in the studio, or, 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 uh, in the TV studio, I should be able to put it on radio. And then I should be able to aggregate the news and put it online. So I had to develop this. I mean, we have to do fiscal work by actually cutting into the studio walls, putting pipes and all that. What do we have to do? Then the technology is that people do Facebook Live. And in the morning, sometimes I wake up and I'm so happy seeing most of the radio studios having all these um, news super review and programs on TV. And it's all on Facebook, it's on social media, it's on you know, all these platforms. So we've done it before. So a bit of experience comes to play. Um, I knew we are going to step into this space again and pioneer this. And I keep telling my team members that it's going to happen somewhere along the line. Technology will come around, people come around, and it will be a lot easier, but we have to be prepared to do most of the work and the thinking. So um, that's what is happening right now. I'm just praying that very soon some of our universities and our schools and the, and the parents out there and the students will all come around and learn that you can actually sit in your home, you can be everywhere and learn. And you know, Joe, in the interest of fairness, it's nice to declare that show. I personally have known you and those days when you started a syndication uh, uh, more than 20 years ago when I was working at Sky Power FM in Takradi and then later on at Joy uh, FM as well. So we certainly go back. And so w what I wanted to find out also, Joe, is uh, you know what you said certainly demonstrate that you've had a spirit of entrepreneurship for a long time. So when did you discover this spirit of entrepreneurship in, in, in yourself? What I recall clearly is when I was a teacher and I didn't, I didn't think I, I, I fitted very well in the classroom situation. It was very limiting. I, I, I felt I had so much energy and so many ideas. I, I didn't think I, it was fair for me to stay in the classroom from 8 to 5, 8 to 5 p.m. So I left. I quit. What I clearly remember was I had thousands of ideas that I could turn into programs, into ideas for media projects. So I stepped into the media space and did a lot. Um, news syndication was one. I was developing concepts almost every day. I was coming up with some kind of idea until around 2 2001, when I set up a business, I needed to set up a simple production house so I could, I could manage my own ideas because you have ideas and um, you are working with someone or working with a company and you are unable to move. I'm a very you know, vibrant person. I feel like I have to do it today and I have to move and do it today. Now, circumstances will force you to become an entrepreneur because you step out there, you have an idea and you are bringing people on board. Now, if the idea is working, you need the resources, you need to manage yourself, you need to manage your time, manage your staff and all that. So gradually, the reality is now going to dawn on you to try and manage your resources and create business that would, you know, be able to sustain itself and sustain others. 
So that's how it started gradually. And I have to repeat this to anybody who is listening to us, any part of the world, um, and especially people around, that you don't just wake up one morning and wish or think I, I, I need to develop a business and think it would grow one day and become such a successful business. I think people need to learn that you would have to you know, learn to make mistakes and correct them and then uh, reshape your ideas and, and keep doing it. You, would, you need to refine your ideas as you go along and it would take so many years. So somewhere along the line, I decided, well, um, let me also branch into consultancy. And I started setting up businesses for people. Now, I just cited an, an example. I set up a couple of radio stations and, and media platforms for clients. Now, if I'm setting up a business for someone, I should be in a position to advise them how to run it and run it successfully and profitably. So then that was when I needed to now learn and you know do it properly so that at the end of the day, if you are working for somebody or setting up something for somebody or advising them, then you'll be able to do a proper job for them. So at, at that point, then I decided, well, let me learn the business aspect. But originally, I had trained as a marketer, but marketing for who? Marketing for others, but now I needed to now put together a business that would last. So that's how it starts. And today, I can say, well, I have two major businesses. I have interest in media, and I also do real estate. And on top of that, you've started these um, major e-learning uh, project that will help transform education uh, as we know it in Ghana and uh, um, hopefully reach other parts of Africa. So uh, you, you, can you a- explain a little bit more about what is involved in this Wolo e-learning project, which involves a comprehensive learning management system uh, where so many things are involved? Can you explain a bit more about that? Um, Wolo um, means book. It's a Ghan word, it's a Ghan language word, which means book. So it's a knowledge project, um, as you've explained, it's about education. And um, what we've decided to do is to find a way to solve some of the problems I, I, I explained earlier. So we are looking at a situation where a child is in the house, they don't have access to be somewhere in the classroom, so we provide some kind of solution. So primarily, it's an e-learning project that will put everything online. The very things you would go to school to learn, the lessons, the lectures, um, the library, the bookstore. So we put everything together in a project online. Now, um, e-learning is a very complex business. It's not like developing a website somewhere and then putting videos on, no. So what you have to um, think about from day one is a situation where perhaps you are going to have thousands of people at the same time on your platform. So it's slightly different from a classroom situation where you have 50, 60 people sitting in front of a teacher. Yes, e-learning would also have a teacher and a student will literally be sitting in front of the teacher. But you are putting all the, these students. You can actually put a million students in front of a teacher, one teacher. And if they are going to go before a teacher in, in on one platform, then better has to be robust. And we didn't, re- we didn't invent the technology. The technology exists. But what we have done is to be able to look at our circumstance and our environment here and be able to craft a solution that responds to our peculiar challenge. So Wolo runs on a system which is a learning management system. And at the last count, um, we have about 82 different software and plug- plugins put together for this system to be able to run 82. Philip, can you imagine having 82 software put together in the system that has to run efficiently? Now, what the system does is that right from the time a teacher decides to prepare for their lesson, they are actually integrated into the system. So from the teacher preparing a lesson all the way to we producing or putting that lesson together as either audiovisual material or um, a text or whatever form, audio form, and you are putting it online. You have to now use technology. And that's where the E comes in. Because it's all electronic. It's all software. So we upload these materials on the platform, and then we get the students to also go on the platform and consume 
the material. So it's basically a learning experience. It's the same classroom situation. We are running the same syllabus that the government schools are running. We are using teachers who are teaching in some of our elite schools. So what we have done is a child in the rural area today can experience, I don't know which school you went to, I know in Ghana we have some of the elite schools, the Sex, the Achimota School, the Ivory League schools, as we would call them. They sometimes have the best teachers who have, have learned, have, have, have improved their craft. So we put them together and we also teach them how to now teach on the e-learning platform. So if it's e-learning, then it has to be e-teaching. And we have trained them, we've given them orientation, and we've put them on this platform. So the rural child is able to now enjoy. So this is primarily what the, the learning management system does. If I'm a parent and my child comes on Wolo today, if I'm interested and I'm monitoring them, if they come on the platform right in front of them, they have eight subjects if they are running SHS or the senior high school system and they are taking eight subjects for the year's course. I'm actually having all the content they need for the 12 months right on one platform. So the child is able to learn anywhere. The child is able to learn in the time and the child is able to learn at their own pace. So this is primarily what e-learning does for you. You learn at your, at, at your own pace and that's beautiful for most of the children. And it's interesting as well that you have the the access because you mentioned access before so you have the wolo website and then you have wolo on tv and you have the wolo as uh, the wolo uh, learning uh, uh, environment as an app on a mobile phone primarily e-learning is online so we have two platforms for the online uh, sta we have the web application and then we have an app, a mobile app. So these two are online, but you and I know too well that in, in, the internet infrastructure in Ghana, uh, just like most of the African, uh, African countries, it's not the best. It's a challenge, especially for rural areas where um, the, the infrastructure is not robust. So we took a different um, you know, view of this and thought that, well, why don't we also provide some offline experience? So for the offline, we decided to also put together two platforms. One is a television, and then the second is what we call Wolo e-learning for communities, WEC. Now, the Wolo e-learning for communities is where um, we can set up a community center somewhere in a rural area, and it's actually designed for deprived communities where the kids may not have internet, or even if they have, they may not be able to afford. So we can go in there and work with the political authority, whether it's a traditional authority, political authority, a member of parliament, I mean, whoever is willing, we can set up a community center and then the, the kids can come in and learn for free. All they need to do is to be committed or parents just encouraging them to come in there and learn. So we are now using television as a, as a vehicle to be able to reach some of these areas. Now, the television is running currently. Um, it's been running from the 30th of last year, December last year. Um, so we've done about six weeks. And it's beautiful. I mean, we have all these beautiful teachers uh, teaching their lessons on television. And it's catching up. At the last count, we've, we've done very well. If you watch the lessons, you can now go back on our platform to interact with other students and the teachers. And it's becoming very, very encouraging and it's motivating us. So, you know, like you said, we have four platforms, two online and two um, uh, offline. So, obviously, when you're learning, you're learning for a purpose <laughs> it's the same for teaching teaching for a purpose so then how will this new way of creating uh, accessibility as you mentioned earlier uh, as well as the quality how will um, how would it help uh, the uh, situation with say ghana and africa in terms of uh, poverty and, and in enhancing development how would it help to enhance development uh, with the view that you are learning for a purpose. Um, the difference between somebody who has ed education in Africa and Ghana and then the uneducated is that that opportunity to be able to have the opportunity to be in classroom and learn. So once we are providing education, then we are solving some of the problems. Now, most of these um, kids who otherwise would have been on the street or 
like like we all know now, we are running a double track system. So the the there is one half of the students who are in school and another half are in the in the house waiting for their turn. What we are doing is filling in the gap. So the the child who is supposed to be in school but is now in the house will be able to learn uh, much the same way as the child who fell by the roadside. There are kids who didn't have the means to be able to learn at all. So they are now on the street hustling or trying to do some menial job or they've abandoned education altogether because they didn't have the opportunity. Now they can actually, wherever they are, whether they are now learning the trade or whatever, they can now pick their phone and use this technology to learn. So with that, then we are providing opportunity for them to be able to also engage meaningfully and then uh, be useful to themselves and their nation. So primarily that's what we have designed and we are we are expecting that um, our skills training aspect of what we have designed will also help those who, for instance, cannot be you know, in the normal school system and learning to write exams. And we are taking care of that. So we are doing the normal school system under the senior high school. And we are also doing skills training. It's part of what we have designed for those who cannot go through the normal system. So the skills training, they don't even need to take any examination. We are putting together packages where people can go online and simply learn a trade. Uh, if they are learning a trade or they are employed by some kind of uh, so some small job somewhere, they can also improve on their craft and then in the future be able to stand on their own or you know, also become entrepreneurs and, and set up their own business. And Joe, given just you know where you stand is an advantageous position because you've invested time and effort to learn so much about the subject, uh, both as an investor and uh, an entrepreneur, uh, having had the background as a teacher, but also as a marketer and having done a lot within the media. So, so then what do you think the future of education then is and uh, uh, linking that to entrepreneurship because it is a field that is uh, being promoted as uh, one way of uh, solving joblessness or unemployment. I'm, I'm happy, um, our president, Nana um, at the last General Assembly, um, the UN General Assembly, raised the issue about e learning and he said it right. You I mean he made categorical statement that in the near future our children would not need to be in the in the classroom or on campuses to be able to learn. That's what he said. And I think that was excellent because that future he was talking about is actually here. It's here right now. The future is online. The future is e-learning. The system we have right now and the boarding system some years to come will fade away. I don't see us 50 years, 25 years, 20 years from now. So, you know, stay in classroom, going through this three years to do high school or four years to do a degree, I don't see it happening. I see a lot changing. And I'm happy to note or put place on record that we are actually working now with some of our universities. Um, we are engaging them, we are having the discussions, and they are actually looking at the opportunity we also put some of the courses we are offering online. So that's going to change very soon. And I'm sure with that kind of change, um, a lot will also change because if I am, I'm learning online and I am, I, I am used to some of these little technologies, I don't see how my small business will not prosper because most of the things we do today currently, our payment system, the banking sector, uh, the health sector, insurance sector, everything, almost everything is on mobile. Everything is changing. We see this huge change in Ghana. And by the way, for the record, 80% of the population here in Ghana are on mobile phones. 80%. Now, if you are looking at this huge number, and in sub Saharan Africa, 75%. The average number is 75. South Africa is 91%. Tanzania is 75. Now, with this huge number, all we need to do is to empower our people by doing e-learning, so that even if I'm a farmer and I've been doing it, I've been doing whatever I've been, I've been trained to do. My grandfather taught me, and I'm using the same old method of farming 
Now we, we should be able to employ some of these technologies to reach anywhere in Africa, rural or urban, and then teach people to do you know, very, very little things for themselves. This very morning, one of the consultants working with us sent me a screenshot. A lady had created a WhatsApp group, a simple WhatsApp group, and then the, the students or people who are signing in are paying 10 CDs, so you pay 10 CDs, and they sign you in, and then she's teaching them how to sew. Sewing for 10 CDs. I mean, these are little things that perhaps somebody will be able to teach online, but you would need to have some kind of training where you are doing it full time. But if I'm a worker and I want to use this as a part time job and I can learn it online, why not? It will help me and then it would improve my situation because it will give me a strength. Well, Joe, it's very impressive uh, what you have done, what you've invested, the time you've uh, spent to think through it, uh, the problems you've seen and, and the systems you've created to solve that problem. It's truly the job of an entrepreneur. And I appreciate you talking to uh, African Port uh, Business Forum. And before I go, though, Joe, I just wondered, as uh, an accomplished entrepreneur, just based on your ideas and the fact that you are always oozing with the ideas, um, there are many who would like to become like you and set things in motion that benefit not just yourself but others what might you have for them uh, because they want to make some progress bring some change uh, into the lives of many what would you have to tell such ones um, what i would want to tell people is to focus on learning and learning very well um, entrepreneurship is not a joke i have always said it and I keep telling my team members and anybody I meet that if you want to be an entrepreneur, you should, you should never be afraid to learn. It, it, it requires a lot of learning. You need to really improve on your craft. And it takes, it takes a lot of time, patience to be able to grow. So that's one thing, key thing that people need to learn, um, the, the opportunity to learn. And we make the mistake by limiting ourselves to what our lecturers teach us in the classroom. I, I rather would, would want to use the knowledge I learned in the classroom to improve on what I'm learning in the world. The world is such a beautiful place, such a huge place with a lot of experience. So that is one. And money has always been an issue. Capital has always been an issue in our part of the world. It is very important, but it is not the most important. I tell people, that we, we have a problem, especially in Ghana, where everybody thinks that we need to work for somebody, or if they are not working for somebody and they want to set up something for themselves, then they should have a bad load of cash before they start. What we need to learn is to be able to roll up their sleeves and, and soil their hands. Mostly, you find everybody, because of the way we are conditioned, we go to school, and everybody wants to ride in a vehicle, we always we have seen ourselves as some manager behind a desk and, and you know, issue instruction. We have a staff. I've seen too many uh, businesses fail because they set up, the first thing they are thinking about an office. So they need to raise money for an office. So even if they have very little to run the business, the first thing is that they think all this money in office space, expenditure and all that. No, I think what's important is a very good, useful idea and being able to implement it. So you dream big, but implement it very small. So one small step at a time, and we should not be afraid to soil our hands and move. Joe, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, and uh, I know that you've said a lot of things that, that are actually words of wisdom that you picked up from working in the trenches. Uh, and sure, you're still in the trenches, but that's where, as you suggested, you learn the most so and i would like to thank you very much and that was the thoughtful business conversation with joe enim the founder of the wolo e-learning project designed as an authentic learning experience for both student and teacher african port business forum is produced by african port media in perth australia the silicon valley of mining energy and business subscribe free to our audio podcast we are on apple podcast spotify google podcast or wherever you listen to your podcast 
to find us on YouTube, just search for African Pod Business Forum. Our website, AfricanPod.com, has more information, including photos and articles of interest. Follow us on social media by searching for African Pod. Don't forget to check all of our previous interviews with exceptional guests, all on African Pod Business Forum.